You're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 151. Money is an exchange of energy. You provide a service and you give energy and money is an energy back. Attention gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and thank you so much for joining me today. Before we get started, I want to make mention of something that I don't think I've ever talked about before on the show, and that is I want to direct you over to my Instagram account at giftbizgal. Each day I represent a quote or some type of important nugget that a guest for the current week's show has brought up in the podcast. It's a business tip that's come up and it's a bite-sized piece of relevant information that will be useful for your business and possibly even right in time for something that you're encountering that day. The Instagram image has the quote and then I expand upon it in the post note section. I invite you to go over and check out that account for more useful information for your business. And now let's get on to the show. Today, I am thrilled to introduce you to Jill Fleming. Jill is a sought after speaker, best selling author, and trusted advisor. While living on a cattle ranch in a tiny town somewhere in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska, Jill didn't have the luxury of calling for help when something didn't work. Instead, she learned to tap into her intuition so she could rapidly create solutions and get right back to business. That explains why she has such a keen eye for seeing things from a different perspective and is especially gifted at helping her clients uncover the next best steps to take in order to create their lives at their highest potential. As an intuitive business strategist and facilitator of freedom, Jill guides entrepreneurs and professionals through the process of clarifying their vision and creating step-by-step fulfillment plans so they can live their best life, starting now. Oh my gosh, I love just the action (laughs) that's involved with that last sentence, and we are going to start now with you, Jill. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. We're going to start off in what? is probably an untraditional way for you when you've had interviews before. And that is by having you describe yourself through a motivational candle. So if you were to tell us a color that really resonates with you and a quote or some type of saying that you live by, tell us what your motivational candle would look like. I say my motivational candle would be purple and it's purple for wisdom. As I feel like in this life, I've gained and always love soaking up lots of wisdom. And the quote that I always go back to is, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And that's by Henry Ford. Oh my gosh, it's all about mindset, isn't it? It is. It is amazing how people can get in their way just by thinking negative. Like it can't be me or it can't happen to me. It's always somebody else, but it could never be me. Right, absolutely. And if that's your thought process, then guess what? You get to be right. That's when I'm working with my clients, if that's what they think, I'm like, well, you can either choose to change that and choose to think differently and put that as a process for yourself. Or guess what? You can be negative and you can and be pessimistic and the universe or whatever you want to call it, it gives you what you ask for. And if that's what you're thinking about, it, that's what you get. Yeah. And you know, the good thing for us, though, really about being an entrepreneur is we are in charge of our destiny. I look at myself in the mirror in the morning and say, you're in charge of whether you're going to be a success today or you have things you need to change. It is all up to you. No matter what things get thrown in front of you, you still are the one to decide how to deal with them. Absolutely. And that's the biggest thing is I was working with a client recently and he was stressed out. And I told him, I was like, you're choosing to be stressed out. He's like, no, these things are happening. I was like, you are choosing how to react to them. Right. You can't change the fact that it happened. The only thing you can change is how you react to it and then how you choose to move forward. So you can do that in a stressful manner or you can be like, okay, this happened. Okay, what am I going to choose now? Or what do I need to do to fix this? Or what can I do to shift this, right? I agree with you entirely. So 
I want to go back to when you were growing up. And the reason I want to do that, Jill, is I think that we do have a lot of listeners who aren't from New York or Los Angeles or these big cities. And I think there's a tendency to think that they have some type of an advantage over everybody else just by sheer population. And I disagree with that. And you're a perfect example. So will you take us back a little bit and share how things were in your hometown? So back when I was growing up, we didn't have the power of the internet. And so there was a little bit more of a challenge of reaching more clients, reaching more customers, those kinds of things. With the power of the internet now, you have just as great of advantage being in New York City as you do in my hometown, which is Valentine, Nebraska. And a small town, right? It was small. Valentine is about 2,500 people. It's the only incorporated town in the county of Cherry County, Nebraska, and Cherry County is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. So it's still three hours to drive to the nearest Walmart where I grew up and where my family still lives. That's crazy. (laughs) It's so interesting, but tell us how you decided to go from there. I mean, college got you out of the town, right? But give us a little bit of that evolution. So I'm actually the first person in my family to graduate from a four-year college. And I was following the process, right, of you go to college, you get a great job, you get engaged, you get married, you have 2.5 kids. Like I was following that process of like that societal programming of what we're supposed to do. And it was funny because I completed college in about three and a half years and then got a great job working for a Fortune 500 company in Des Moines, Iowa and moved there and started doing that. I had a guy and we got engaged and bought a house. And I got there at the pinnacle of what we're supposed to reach by like age 25. And I got there and I was like, this is it? Like, I thought this is supposed to be like the angels are supposed to come out and everything's supposed to be like, "Ah, you made it. (laughs) (laughs) I made it. And I got there and I just wasn't happy. And I was like, okay, what is this? I ended up calling off the engagement, selling the house. I stayed working at my corporate job a while longer, but at the time I was doing photography on the side. And as I started to build that side business while I was still working my corporate job, that was what kept me sane. I was absolutely miserable at my corporate job and continued to do more and more photography and teach myself more and more skills through going to workshops and trainings and finding quality mentors. And I got to, it was funny, I got to age 30 and I was sitting at my desk one day and I had the thought that if I'm sitting here when I'm 40, I'm going to want to shoot myself. That was a pretty heavy thought. And it really made me like stop and take note and really look at that of like, whoa, I really need to do something different. So you had just built up and you'd had this feeling inside you already that this just wasn't enough. And then it became that moment at your desk where you're like, realization hits, I've got to change it. Yes. And that was when the fear set in of I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, right? Of what we're told we're supposed to do, go to college, get a good job. And I was working for a Fortune 500 company, like one of the top companies in the country and had great benefits and a pretty decent pay, but I was just absolutely miserable. And it was funny when I made the decision to go full-time photography, it was after a friend of mine who I consider him my first coach. He kind of gave me that swift kick in the butt I needed of, he's like, why don't you do it? And I was like, I'm scared I will fail. And he's like, okay, so you fail, then what? It was really interesting that nobody had ever asked me, then what? right? It's like usually fear of failure is such this big, scary thing that we're so scared to even look at of happening that we just don't even want to look at it. And it was like, oh, then what? He's like, what is the absolute worst case scenario? So you take this leap of faith, you go full time with your photography business. What is the absolute worst case scenario? And my answer was I could fail. And he's like, okay, so you fail, then what? And I was like, oh, there's an after? Because usually it's like, oh, that's the end. Life will not continue to go on. And he's like, if you fail, will they take away your birthday? And I'm like, well, no. (laughs) (laughs) And that's cute. (laughs) Right? Well, and I think that we also should define fail because fail means your whole business isn't working. Maybe just something that you're doing as you're getting up and getting started and getting the first clients isn't the right way to do it. So you might be failing, I hate to use those words, but at just the way you're trying to capture clients, it's not you're failing at your whole photography business. Right. 
Well, and since then, I have done a lot of personal development and leadership work. And I now term failure, like, I don't even see anything as failure. It's only a failure if you didn't learn something. And you always learn something from mistakes that happen or things that happen. You always learn something. Yeah. Or it's a failure if you allow that to stop you. But then again, you've been in control and you've allowed that to happen. Jill, I'd be curious about how you'd feel about this. If your friend was not a major supporter for you at that time, do you think you would have made a change? Absolutely. It would have just taken me longer. Okay. It would have happened. It would have just taken me longer of getting there myself. I consider him my first coach. That's why I love doing coaching now is just helping people get there faster and be able to see the possibilities quicker than on their own, especially from somebody who's already been there. So he had been in business for himself for over five years. So he had already walked that path and he knew what I then did not know. And that's one of the reasons I love coaching too, is I know now things that people that are starting their business or a few years in business, they haven't experienced yet so that I can be like, hey, be prepared for this. And he said the same thing. He's like, be prepared that people aren't going to understand your choice. And that was another thing. There's a book out there called The Dream Giver that I highly recommend. And in that book, it talks about leaving the land of familiar to go towards your dream. And as you leave the land of familiar, you run into what they call border bullies. And border bullies are often the people that you know, love and trust. And that often you feel like they have your best interest at heart. But oftentimes it's actually in their best interest to keep you in your land of familiar so that they can stay comfortable and they don't have to try to redefine you. Right. I've run into a few of those myself. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it was interesting that my mom was actually my biggest border bully. And every time that I would talk about leaving my corporate job, she was like, well, you get paid great. You have amazing benefits. For her, that was the holy grail. But for me, I wasn't happy. And it was interesting when I finally got to that point, I told my mom, I'm like, hey, I'm going to quit my corporate job and I'm going to take my part time photography business full time. She was like, oh, my gosh, you can't do that. And like, that's a really bad decision. That's a bad choice. And I was like, mom, I love you. And I just need you to either get on board or be quiet. You can't almost fault that generation, though, because that's what they knew. And that's what they always strive for, that job and the security and the insurance and all of that was security. We all know that jobs aren't secure anymore, right? So you can't almost fault them for not totally understanding the view. Okay, so you're, Jill, kind of a specialist on clarity. And as I listened to your story, you got very clear that your corporate job wasn't going to be where you are going to be happy. So you ramped up your photography business. And then at some point, I guess you became very clear that there was more you could offer the world too because of what you're doing now. What would you say to somebody who's listening who's like, what does clarity even mean? And Does it just come and show its face to me one day? Or how does that all happen when you really have that confidence that you're going to make the changes? I would say clarity comes when you get really focused in on what you'd love. Because so often what happens is we spend our lives doing what other people think is in our best interest, as opposed to really dialing in and really tuning into our inner wisdom to figure out what is it that I would really love? Like what would bring me joy? What would bring me happiness? What would I love to do? And how would I like my life to look like? And I think that that clarity comes there. And a lot of times the biggest barrier to clarity is that we don't want to disappoint others. There's oftentimes we know what we know what we know. And that's what I love working with my clients about is often my clients know, they just oftentimes aren't willing to choose it. And so I like being what I call a wing woman. So I like to fly with them so that I'm flying with you so that you're like, okay, we're going to fly around this hill. We're going to dodge this thing. And to be able to fly with someone as they're taking that journey into really leaving behind that old programming and that old, those old mindsets while they're stepping into and choosing what they really want in their life. I love the concept of the wing woman. That's perfect. Because although whoever your client is or whoever that person is, is front and center in the business, then they don't feel like they're alone, which of course is what a lot of coaches will do. And so you focus on the clarity comes from really, really focusing on what you love. Do you think that people can turn anything that they love into a business? 
I would say no. There still is a matter of what does the market desire. So something that you love, like there has to be a marketability for a business. There has to be a need that you're filling or a desire that you're filling. So I wouldn't say anything, but probably an offshoot of what you want, there's a possibility. Does that make sense? Yeah. So maybe let's say someone tests something that they love. Let's call it a product or whatever it is, and it doesn't work. Maybe some adjustments or something. So they're still in the vein of what they love. It's just presented to the market in a different way. Correct. Yeah. And so that's where I would say, I wouldn't say anything, but oftentimes that thing that you love doing, if you modify it or you come at it from a different perspective or you market it in a different way, or you go out to your market of the people that you would love to serve and ask them what they desire or what is something in their life that they would really want to help them make their life easier or something that they would enjoy having or those kinds of things and find a market that you love to serve and then create products or create things that you love to do that serves that market. Perfect. Really smart. Okay. So you dive in to a topic that a lot of us cringe at, and that is money. (laughs) And (laughs) when we talk about business, obviously people go into business to make money. I always tell people, if that's your number one goal, don't start because you're going to fail. You've got to love what you're doing first, and then the money comes afterwards. But I know we all have, the negative word that comes to mind is hang up. And that's not really what I mean to say, but we all have emotions wrapped around money. Maybe that's the better way for me to say that. Talk to us a little bit about that, the blocks that come up and what do we do about this whole money topic? Oh, yes, money. And that's the interesting thing is that money is really just energy. Money is an exchange of energy. If you provide a service and you give energy and money is an energy back. And when you can get to that understanding is that money is just energy, it can allow to move past a lot of that programming. It's just getting to that point. And I think that you said that you had gone onto my website and did my sacred money archetypes assessment. I did. And I want everyone to do it. So why don't you mention that right now? And then we'll go through what you're talking about. If you go and sign up on my website, there's a free assessment you can take and it's called the sacred money archetypes. And what's great about that is it kind of dials in who you are and more than likely where your struggles are with money. And then when you know where your struggles are with money, there's procedures and there's things that you can do to help overcome that, to be like totally move past your money blocks and like really start making a profit in your business. I was telling Jill in the pre-chat that it was such a fun assessment to take and it's free, you guys. So just go ahead and go and do the assessment. I haven't done all of my analysis. We (laughs) we talked about that too, because I wanted to do it before we got on and recorded this interview. So I had had the experience so I could share that with all of you guys. But it's a different type of a quiz or assessment that you normally take just by structure and how it all comes together at the end. Super fun and a little bit different, which makes it really interesting. So again, I encourage everybody to go over and do that. And that's over on your website, Jill, which is Living Beyond Logic. So livingbeyondlogic.com. Okay, so let's get back into the money thing. This was a nice like little path up into this major topic. Now let's really talk about money and fears. And the fact is you need to invest in your business too, but that's scary because... That means you're giving away money with possibly no return. Right. And it's a matter of when you're starting your business of what are you doing to make money? And oftentimes when there's money blocks, we do all the other little things that we think we're supposed to do instead of make money. That's kind of self-defeating, isn't it? Because if you're not doing, I call them money generating tasks. If you're not doing money generating tasks, you're not going to make money, which was your fear in the first place. Yes, I call them revenue generating tasks. So we're pretty close. And what percentage of your day are you devoting to those money generating tasks? Are you only devoting 10% of your day or are you devoting 80% of your day? And to continue to focus on what those revenue generating tasks are that bring money into your business as opposed to, oh, I need to, is writing a blog going to make you more money versus making five sales calls? Yeah, but the sales call part is way scarier for most people. 
Right. It's way scary. It's way easier to do a blog and hope somebody sees it and calls you as opposed to actually getting on the phone and calling somebody and say, hey, I thought of you. This is something that I have. And I'd like you to invite you to take a look at it. Is this something you might be interested in? Right. Of making a request or making an invitation. And so where are those things that you're doing? Where do they fall on that money generating task scale? Is it at the bottom end of the scale of absolutely doing blog posts and doing podcasts and doing all those things are great and they can generate income over a longer term. But usually when you're just starting a business, you want to really focus on those things that get money into your business quickly. So then once you have money in your business, then you can reinvest in your business. So how do you do that in your day? How would somebody who's listening right now figure out how to stay focused on revenue generating tasks? I think it's different for everyone. I like to work with what comes naturally to people and then make some modifications of, okay, are you a morning person? Are you a night person? If you are a night person, I have some tips and tricks for people that if they're the most productive in the evening, I have some tips and tricks that they can use that make them look like they're a morning person, right? (laughs) Because sometimes you just have to be, right? (laughs) Sometimes you just have to be. And unfortunately, as much as when we're creating our own business and as entrepreneurs, we work at all hours of the day, the main workday is still eight to five. And that is when the majority of people are doing business. And so we still kind of have to conform to that at some level. And so depending on where your clients are, So if your clients are moms, then maybe the time of day that you're really doing calls or doing things is from one to two or from 10 to noon when most kids are in school. It's like really dialing in on who your target market is and your ideal client is and what is their schedule. Yeah, when they're accessible. And when are they accessible and how can you reach them? If you're working, if you're consulting with corporations and companies, it's Monday through Friday, eight to five. And the trick with that one is if you're wanting to reach like a CEO or someone at a higher level, you call at 730 before their secretary gets in. There's a great tip for you. (laughs) I've actually done that in my corporate day. I landed one of my largest accounts by doing that. (laughs) Absolutely. It works. Call before the gatekeeper shows up. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you say this little sales idea just came up to me? If you're looking at working with people who are corporate, how do you think it looks sending an email at 8 p.m. at night? I don't think that in this day and age that that looks. Does it matter anymore? I would say yes and no. I would say I always notice when somebody sends that. One of the tools I use is that you can schedule your emails. So even if I'm working at 11 or midnight, I send my emails so that they show up at 8.15. Are you using Boomerang or something like that? Yeah, that's one of the tools I use. Yeah. So like sending them so they show up at like 8.15. So it looks like I'm up and I'm working early in the morning because I am not a morning person. But that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur is I get to set my own schedule. And so I work late the night sometimes and I set all my emails to go out in the morning. And so that when I am up and I am working, I often have responses from them and then I can respond to them and keep on moving. Oh, that's a good point. That goes back to who your customer is. And I think, especially for corporate, sending something so that it lands in the inbox early in the morning means it's also more at the top of the list when they enter into their inbox. Jill, I have a question for you about the assessment because you were making the comment that everyone has a little bit of a different approach. Everyone's comfortable and uncomfortable with different things. Is this somewhat what the assessment gets to? Yes, it looks at your different blocks and the different things that you are both strengths of your different types of archetypes and the challenges. And so when you know what your strengths are and you know what your challenges are, then you can work to those. I always say work to your strengths and hire for your challenges if you can. And then if that is a challenge, once you know that that's a challenge, you can put some things in place to make those things easier for you. Got it. My friends and my clients, they joke that I'm a hacker because they look at things and they're like, I can't do this. I'm like, yes, you can. You just da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, I hate getting up in the morning and I hate have to be up and to send these emails. I was like, well, then just use this. They used to use like a, a program like Boomerang and do all your emails at night and they show up. And they're like, you can do that. And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Perfect. Could you give us maybe either a real or fictitious example without naming names or anything of how that all works? 
so we can put a little more depth to the conversation. So if someone finds out that they're a certain type, what do they do and what do they not do? Can you give us some type of example? An example is I worked with one client and she found out what her archetypes were. And just knowing what her archetypes were was a big awareness for her of areas that she had been struggling in. And then I worked with her one-on-one to kind of dive in deeper with what her top archetypes were. And then we actually did some work together to actually shift that. There's a, I call it kind of a money meditation that I worked through with someone to try to get into that subconscious of where a lot of that programming is. And then we work one-on-one of putting a plan in place to really help them use those archetypes to their advantage. You had mentioned that when you took your assessment that you thought nurturer would have been higher. Right. That was second to last, Jill. I I don't like that. (laughs) I don't know what it means yet. That's actually kind of a good thing. Just from you mentioning that, it tells me that you've learned how to have better boundaries because oftentimes that's what the nurturer struggles the most with is that they give everything away and they have really poor boundaries. Okay. Well, I think that is important. So I will agree with you there. I'm curious to know, like I said, I haven't seen, now that I've taken it, I haven't been able to dive into what everything means, but I'm excited to do so. I think that might be some weekend analysis for me, maybe. (laughs) I also offer a free like 30 to 45 minute consultation. So if you get through your assessment and you still have questions, I'm happy to jump on the phone and talk with you further about it and kind of dive into that deeper and see how you can use that to really move your business forward and shift your money stories. Oh, that's awesome. That's a huge offer, Jill. Thank you. You're welcome. I think this is a perfect place to take a break and hear a word from our sponsor. This podcast is made possible thanks to the support of the Ribbon Print Company. Create custom ribbons right in your store or craft studio in seconds. Visit theribbonprintcompany.com for more information. Okay, so your company is called Beyond Logic. What does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) it's one of my favorite things and if you look at my page my logo is actually a knight chess piece with wings on it well because you're the wing woman right i am the wing woman and in chess a knight can only move in an l pattern but when you give it wings it can move wherever it wants to Ooh, yeah (laughs) so i love that and so beyond logic is logic is actually just an illusion And oftentimes in our society, there's so much weight given to logic that logic is really just an accumulation of our past experiences and belief systems telling us what's possible. And so if you have faulty logic programmed in, it's often telling you what you can't do. And so when you go beyond logic, you can actually get where you want to go of like reprogramming what that logic is. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, why do we always gravitate to what we think is going to be the worst for us? I guess it's the fear thing. Instead of saying with logic, all of this is possible, all of us, imposter syndrome, whatever we want to say is, internally, we bring up all the reasons why it couldn't possibly be true for us. Right. And I look at that too is like we have our right brain and our left brain. And it it actually kind of tunes into our brain is our left brain is very logical and very analytical. And our right brain is very creative. And I say that our right brain is more heart centered as well. And oftentimes what I see happen is that our left brain and our right brains, our logic and our heart are actually supposed to be working as a team. Logic isn't bad. So it's actually supposed to work together of logic is, is like, okay, I want to quit my job and travel the world. So logic comes in and goes, if that's what your heart says, and your logic comes in is like, we can't do that right? Right. If logic was on your team, it would be like, we can't do that now. But how could we do that? How can we plan for it? How could we plan for it? How could we make that happen? And that's where logic kind of what I say is our left brain often becomes a bully and kind of likes to be in control. And so when our heart comes up and says, Oh, I'd love to da 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 da, our logic comes in and comes is like, No, we can't do that. Because this, this, and this happened in our past. And like we can't make that happen because of X, Y, Z. Whereas if we allow our heart and our left brain and our right brain to be in balance, we can create so much more and have so much more fulfillment. 
that makes so much sense and I've never heard anyone really describe it in that way before. That is really good. So I know also you have techniques to get people to just get back in control. Now, whether they're stressed out or they're super frustrated and you know how it is, our thoughts build on itself and it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and we are super stressed out. And you have some special ideas of how to deal with these situations. Yes. There's a couple different things that I use. One of them is if you think of like thoughts being energy. I don't know if you've ever been around people and they're just, I call them like energy vampires. They kind of just suck you dry being around them. And what I always say is like when you're in that space to really focus on of like, okay, am I 100% me? Because oftentimes people project thoughts and ideas at you and we take them on as if they're our own when they're actually not. When it's someone else's perception. Somebody else's point of view. It's somebody else's thought process. And it's actually not our own, but we take it on as if it's our own. Because we validate ourselves by reactions of others, right? Exactly. Reactions and comments of others that might not be right. Yes. And so one of those things is I ask myself, okay, am I 100% me? And I'm very intuitive and I've done a lot of work. I started out doing this with muscle testing. It's called applied kinesiology. And I started doing it with muscle testing, but as I've developed it for myself, I naturally intuitively hear a yes or a no now. And so when I'm sitting and I'm getting ready to do something, I always go, okay, am I 100% me today? And if I get a no, I'm like, okay, anything that is not me, not mine, any energy, any emotions, any point of views that are not mine, I return them to sender with consciousness. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> So I return that and I'm like, okay, now am I 100% me? And I usually get a yes. And then I'm like, okay, that now, and usually it creates a lightness. And another tool I use is light and heavy. Lightness is when something is true for you, it'll feel really light and expansive. And when something isn't true for you, it'll feel really heavy and contractive. And so really tuning into the energy of something of when you're thinking about doing it, does it light you up? Does it feel really expansive? Like, oh, this would be amazing. Or when you think about it, is it like, oh, gosh, like, oh, just it feels really heavy and contractive. And these are tools that I've actually learned through a process or a group called Access Consciousness. And these tools are really amazing to really help you tune into something to know what's true for you and to also to be able to choose for you as well. So how is that different? Because I could see someone liking to use this as an excuse. So let's go back to picking a revenue generating task. Like you need to make those five sales calls today instead of perfecting some artwork on your website or whatever it is. But those tasks are scary. They're out of your comfort zone. So they would feel heavy, right? Because they're not comfortable for you. Yeah, that is the trick of resistance oftentimes feels heavy as well. And so when we're resistant to do something that we know we need to do, like that inner wisdom says, hey, if I call Mary, like I have a inner wisdom hit, an intuitive hit that Mary may want what I have. And then we don't listen to that. We don't take action. It's like kind of trusting your awareness, but then you have to take action to make things happen. And sometimes there's a difference between heaviness and being uncomfortable, uh, expanding your comfort zone and doing some of those things to grow your knowledge and your wisdom. There's a difference there. Does that make sense? It does. And I wanted to bring it up only because I could see people saying, okay, well then I'm out. I get a pass because it's heavy. <laughs> so when you're in a situation like that where you're anxious or nervous or stressed, then you also need to kind of analyze, okay, is it something that's heavy or is it something where I'm just uncomfortable? And in that case, you just want to push through. Right. Yeah. Is it something that's really heavy and I don't feel like it's for me, I feel it in my gut, right? I'm like, oh, this almost makes me feel sick. And then, but resistance feels different of, oh, I really don't want to do that. But it's something that I know that if I take those steps and take action, that it will create something for me. Right. And I would say when you do something that you're uncomfortable with one time and it works, then you can use that as a model. So if you go back and you're in a situation, once again, where you have to push through, you can say, well, look, I did it last time and look what happened. And those start to build on themselves then too, I think. Yes, definitely. 
Well, you create taking those steps, right? You create a pattern for yourself of breaking through those things that are uncomfortable. And there's an example, I usually draw it out, but I'll try to paint a picture of it of we all talk about being in a box, right? And our box is usually our comfort zone. And our hopes, goals and dreams are outside of our comfort zone. Otherwise, if they weren't, they would already be in the box. So what happens is as we go to leave the box, and I'll reference that book, The Dream Giver, of leaving that land of familiar, leaving that comfort zone, and we start taking those steps towards our hopes, goals, and dreams, it's going to get uncomfortable. But what happens is as you get outside of your box and you're out there and unfamiliar, what happens is fear and excitement are the exact same emotion. We just label it differently. Your palms get sweaty. You get kind of short of breath. And you're like, oh, what am I doing? And so if you really look at that, fear and excitement are the exact same emotion. It's just choosing what to label it. So as you get out into unfamiliar, and if you label that emotion excitement, and you stay there, and you make the choices to stay there and to expand your comfort zone, that comfort zone will expand. I love it. What happens is our brain is actually really lazy. And if it can talk you out of doing something new, so it doesn't have to learn something new and run back into your comfort zone, then it's succeeded. That's where we come back to mindset. And then you stagnate because if you don't do anything that's different, you're not going to grow. Yeah. And you're not going to achieve those hopes, goals, and dreams. Right. Because as you continue to get comfortable being uncomfortable and growing that comfort zone, pretty soon that comfort zone is going to encompass all those hopes, goals, and dreams. Yep. Because your box has expanded. Exactly. Wonderful. Love that. That's a great example. And you described it so well. What would you say, Jill, kind of as a final piece of advice to someone who's listening to all of this, maybe is back when you were just switching out and thinking you were going to do photography full time. So they're right back there. You know so much now. You've had a lot of success. You've continued to grow and expand your box. What words of wisdom would you have for someone who's just thinking, okay, well, maybe Jill has something to this? What's your advice to them? My advice to you is be selective on who you receive advice from. So when I was leaving my corporate job to go full-time with my photography business, people that had a job and who worked in my office, they tried to intervention me. They tried to talk me out of it. Oh my gosh. Five people pull me into a room and try to be like, what are you doing? This won't work for you. I can't believe you're making this choice. And then I had friends that were entrepreneurs who had been out doing business for themselves for several years. And they were, oh my God, it's going to be amazing. You're going to go awesome. It's going to be fantastic. You're going to love it. You're going to do great. And so with that, I would say be very selective on who you receive advice from as you're stepping into that and you're making that choice. Take advice from people who are doing it and who have done it. And oftentimes those are not your friends and family. And when we're thinking about making a big change or making a big step, we often run it by our friends and family and they can't see it. They can only see us for who we are in our box, not for who we want to be outside of our box. Right. And they genuinely want to protect you too. And they genuinely want to protect you. Yes. And they don't want you to stumble or have a possibility of failure And oftentimes it's selfish for them too, because when you grow, oftentimes it makes them grow too and see you in a different way. And so when you're making those choices of be very selective on who you receive feedback from and who you receive advice from, especially if you're doing anything creative, especially like photography, creative fields are so subjective. And I remember when I was a budding young photographer, I had another photographer that I looked up to that gave me a really, really harsh critique. What I'm really grateful for is I had another friend and mentor come alongside me and she's like, this person was critiquing your style, not how you do it. For me, of like photography wise, I love bright and vibrant photographs. And the person who gave me the really harsh critique like subdued and dark and like black and white photographs. And she gave me a really harsh critique saying that, oh, your photos are too bright. I was like, well, that's my style. And so that's really something to look at too is in the creative field, everything is subjective. So one person may not like what you create, but you know what? It might be the thing that another person has always been looking for. Well, and then it becomes the thing that you're known for too. Yes. So the people who really love that style are going to love you even more because that's what you're all about. That's what you represent. 
And another piece of advice I would say is you are not your ideal client. Oh, good one. So just because you wouldn't pay for that or you wouldn't do it that way or you wouldn't pay this much for this thing never means somebody else would not. Very good. Wonderful. Great, great comments all the way through here, Jill. You have given us so much to consider, change of mindset, taking that assessment, all of that. So now I want to give you a gift. I want to invite you to dare to dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this would be your dream or your goal that's almost unreachable that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it here in front of all of us. What is inside your box? I would say that I feel like it's unattainable, but it's definitely a stretch goal for me. Of Inside my box would be teaching and training on stage at my own event here in San Diego. In that event, I'd be supporting women entrepreneurs to break through their mindset, their money, and their visibility blocks that are keeping them from really launching and flying in their business so that they could enjoy the possibilities, the purpose, and the profit that they desire. Beautiful. So you're really taking your coaching and then just up leveling it into a live experience with multiple people there. Yes. Oh, I see that as totally attainable. And we're going to cheer you on for you to get there. Thank you. That's (laughs) perfect. (laughs) So Jill, I think you have something exciting happening at the end of this month. This happens to be January. So when our listeners hear this, it's going to be up and going already. What is going on? At the end of February, I'm actually launching my book, and the title is called Freedom to Fly, and it is for visionary entrepreneurs, and it's a guide to really activating your inner wisdom to confidently create more possibility, purpose, and profit in your life and business. Oh my gosh, that sounds fabulous. I am already going to purchase one. Where do we find it? It's on Amazon. And if you just go to amazon.com and either do a search for Freedom to Fly or for my name, Jill Fleming, then you should be able to find it. Perfect. And Gift Biz listeners, as you know, there'll be a show notes page, all the links for Jill connected up there, as well, the link to her brand new book. So exciting. Yeah, I'm really super excited to get that out there. And how should our listeners reach out to you again? They'll go on your website and take the assessment. And your website is again livingbeyondlogic.com. Perfect. You offered up a one-on-one free call if anyone wants to go further after they've taken that assessment. Any other comments in terms of how to get in touch with you? Any final words for our audience here? No, I don't think so. I think that just going through my website, my, all of my contact information is on my website. I always do a complimentary consultation just to see if working with someone is going to be a good fit. And so if if there's anyone out there that feels like I might be able to support them, I'm always happy to have a conversation with them. Well, thank you so much for taking your time out of the day to share all your wisdom with us, Jill. And may your candle always burn bright. Thanks so much, Sue. This episode is all wrapped up, but fortunately, your gift biz journey continues. Are you eager to learn more? Our gift biz gal has a free download just for you. Head over to giftbizunwrapped.com slash 12 steps to get your copy of the 12 steps to starting a profitable gift biz. Don't delay. Head over to giftbizunwrapped.com slash 12 steps today. And until next time, happy business crafting.